Hey everyone, welcome back and today we are going to talk about one of the very interesting topic from the web vulnerabilities that is web cache deception. I like this one actually so I thought to make a video on this as well. So we will start a little bit with the basics and then we will move on to how this attack actually works. I have made a video on web cache poisoning as well in my previous video I'll provide the link in the i button. You can check that out. These two vulnerabilities are kind of similar but not very similar because the attack scenario is a bit different. But one thing is same here, which is we are exploiting how the web caching is working here. Also, this is really interesting bug if, if you're hunting and you see in the response that says cache hit or miss something like that or some other caching headers, you can definitely try this vulnerability out. It's not even that hard to exploit. Okay, let's jump into it. Starting with a little bit introduction about web caching. Web cache is a way of storing copies of web pages or other web content so that they can be accessed faster in the future. It's like temporarily storing the previous viewed web pages. So when you go to application for the first time, it gets cached for you in the caching server. And so next time, if you try to visit that application, it's going to fetch that web page for you from the caching server. That way, it would be faster to fetch it. Now, it depends on the configuration. Some pages would be set by the web caching to render it, otherwise it would be not. Now, you also need to know about cache keys. To determine whether there is a cache response present or not, the system uses cache keys like header, query parameters, or other elements from the HTTP request. So again, this depends on the configuration of the caching system, which parameter or header it is using to determine the presence of that the page in the server in the caching server so another thing you need to know is cache rules cache rules determine what can be cached and for how long you must have seen some uh, attributes in the header like cache control header you see like public and then max age and there's some value in it so max age determine for how long the cache will be stored so the number of milliseconds is written there Sometimes you'll also see a value in the cache header that is dynamic. So if it's dynamic means it's not getting cached. So there's no point of testing for this vulnerability there. I want to point that out, saving your time. I mean, how you're going to exploit the caching mechanism when it's not getting cached in the first place. So it is important to look at that first. Of course, we're going to look at number of steps and how you can identify them and exploit them further in the video. But let's just keep moving on. Okay, so if you want to know a particular definition of what web cache deception vulnerability is, in simple words, when a CDN is caching any page and that page contains sensitive information, let's say user's personal information, API key, token, or something that is uh, unique for the user and it's getting cached, and that cached response can be accessed by the other user as well the unintended user then it's a web cache deception vulnerability similar to how you do in web cache poisoning you use a cache key to cache some response and then the other users get affected from that cache response right in this case similar thing happens but in a little different way now focus first we find out a particular endpoint that is caching a sensitive information so you add a cache key let's say abc.js now, you won't send this request. You're just going to copy the URL and send this URL to the victim. Or if you're testing this out yourself while bug hunting, you can just uh, copy that URL and open up in incognito mode. And if you're able to access the URL without authentication and you still see the sensitive information in the page, then you have found the web cache deception vulnerability. Because without authentication, you are able to access this web page just because it is cached by this unique identifier. We will look more into that, but now you are seeing the difference, right? In web cache poisoning, you usually wait for other users to visit. But in this case, you are crafting a request and you're sending that fresh request to a victim user. Now let's talk about how some cache rules work in the 
web caching mechanism. So as we saw that caching rules determine how web content is stored for how long and who can access it. But misconfigured cache settings can lead to performance issues or worse security vulnerabilities like web cache deception attack. So the first header is cache control header. This header controls how and for how long the content is cached. Its value goes like uh, cache control, then two attributes public and max age with a value in milliseconds. So public allows caching by browsers and CDNs. So if you see this means it's a green flag, it's getting cached and you can try out the vulnerability here. The second one is no store rule. You might have seen this in some cache control header. It tells not to store any part of the request or response and it is commonly used for sensitive content like login or account pages. But sometimes let's say you visited an endpoint and that endpoint is revealing some sensitive information in the HTML body but um, there is no rule set like this no store or dynamic value means it is getting cached. In that case you can definitely try. Now the third header is file type rules. Now this one is interesting because this rule allows static assets such as .css or .js files or image files that are usually cache or performance. So dynamic pages like .php or user dashboards should not be cached unless properly controlled. So basically the web cache is caching based on the extension of the files. But sometimes there is no file type rules like that which can also lead to web cache deception vulnerability query string handling. Some caching systems ignore query strings while others treat URLs with query parameters as unique. So improper handling can lead to caching user-specific private content. Now this example we saw earlier how adding a query parameter made the web caching think that it is a unique request. So it cached it and the unintended user were able to access it. In order to exploit web cache deception, you have to find weirdness. <laughs> you have to find some weirdness in the response. What I mean by that. So basically, you try to add some random value in the request and you see how the server responds. Basically, you're trying to analyze the caching rules. So first way to do that is mapping URLs. Sometimes the cache on the origin server treats similar URLs as same or different. And that mismatch can be exploited. We saw earlier that if you add a query string, the server is still going to give you the same response. So for example, the cache treats slash admin and slash admin slash as same resource, but the origin server treats them differently. Maybe slash admin is public, but slash admin slash is protected. This can lead to sensitive content being cached and served to unauthorized users. And the second one is processing special characters. For example, some characters in URLs like encoded slashes or semicolons act as delimiters and different systems might parse them in a different ways. For example, percent to %f which is the encoded form of forward slash could be interpreted differently based on the web caching configuration. The cache might treat slash admin percent to f config as one file path, but the origin server might decode it as slash admin slash config, which could be protected. So again, a scenario where this could be exploited. Third one is path normalization. Path normalization refers to how URLs are cleaned up before being processed. So if the cache and origin do this differently, it can create bypass opportunities. This is how. So let's take an example. The cache might normalize slash images slash dot dot slash admin to slash admin and serve the response. Now the origin server might not and still see the full unnormalized path. So this is what the weirdness in cache rules I'm talking about. So you have to analyze this thing in the response and based on that, you have to craft your request as well. Okay, so this is basically the description of how the web cache deception attack works. We want to focus on the steps to reproduce. First is you log into your account and then you go to this particular path, register confirmation success. Okay, so you get this basically when you register your account and it is confirmed. Then you go after 
to this particular path. So this one is created by the attacker. As you can see, non.css is added to the URL and this doesn't exist, but it will get cached by the server. Now open the private mode or the incognito window any other browser and paste this particular URL in the address bar. Now you can see then without authenticated can access all the earning state of an authenticated user account. Now as you can see this is similar to example I showed there. Now this you have to keep in mind that this is a criteria for this to work the user should be logged in and containing the personal content and token information to be cached and thus publicly accessible, it could get even worse if the body of the response contains uh, some session identifier, security answers, or CSRF tokens. Now, this scenario did happen and we're going to look at the second report. Okay, so this is something that you can really try. Moving on to the next report. The previous one had a low severity. As I said, it depends on how the application is functioning. In this case, the severity is pretty high because it leads to account takeover. This was possible because of two reasons. The session token was reflected in the cache response and the server was responding with 200 OK that allows a cache to last longer than any other response. Now the caching server sees this particular value as you can see cache.jpg. The researcher has added this particular file with this extension and the server sees this as cacheable response due to the JPEG extension at the end of the URL. Now this is what I said, find the weirdness. Some web servers determine what should be cached based on the cache rule. In this case, the cache rule was to cache anything that has a .jpg extension. So that's why there is this particular value. The server will save it. And now if you deliver this to victim and if they're logged in, in their browser, you'll be able to see their session token reflected in the response like this. So this is a pretty critical case. You can just take that particular session token, add it over here. And you can see anyone's profile that could lead to account takeover and edit them as well. Now, I find this one really amazing. I'll provide these two reports a link in the description as well. Well, now there are more examples in this and different scenarios in this attack as well. And for that, I'm going to cover different both sugar labs in my next videos i'm not going to add in this video because i wanted this video as some kind of a little bit theory and practical part and then moving to the labs in the other parts of the video but i'm going to explain those labs truly not just going to solve them so i'll see you in those videos hope you like this one and if you have any more questions you can type that out in the comment section thank you for watching and i'll see you in the next one